remember on about my 10th birthday or 10th Christmas, I asked for the best of David Bowie as an LP. So I, I got that and I remember taking that along to my junior school uh, leaving party. So everyone's bringing these sort of pop records, I suppose, and there's me with the best of David Bowie. Which I kind of think back on that and think, oh, that was, that was fairly cool, man, for a sort of, for a sort of ten year old. But, um, yeah, no, I've still got that, I think. Uh, I went with my dad for that one and a couple of his friends, and uh, that was quite a good gig because there was a band on, uh, the band that started it, or started off the gig earlier in the afternoon, was a quite little known band at that time called In Excess. The next band on was The Alarm. And I remember them making a considerable noise in the stadium and really testing out this <laughs> the structure of the building. And also, and then after that, it was status quo. So status quo in the rain. Right. The rain was pouring down, but they didn't care. They're out there in the rain. And then, obviously, then Queen came on, and it was just yeah, blew me away. But that was the first. I'm pretty sure that was the first major. I've been in a stadium for football gigs before, but not for not for a stadium concert. Uh, but I've watched the, that's actually one of my links to Malvern, is um, the weekend that Live Aid was on, I was actually in Malvern on a, on a school trip. Uh, so I listened to all of that gig uh, on a transistor radio while we are being walked up and down the hills on this you know, school trip walk thing. And I remember being in the, um, uh, being in the youth hostel late at night listening to all the stuff from the States. So I was up until early in the morning listening to like Led Zeppelin and the Thompson Twins and all that sort of stuff going on from Live Aid. Um, so that's, that, that's interesting, that's a bit of a connection to Marvel. Then obviously after that Queen got quite a bit of notoriety after that and it was after that that they then did their you know, sell out um, uh, Wembley gigs were huge. Um, uh, it was such a thing, and then there was the full album wasn't released for a while. There was a there was an album which covered that tour, which I remember buying on cassette, and it was like best off from a few different venues and things. And then later on, they then released a double CD of the whole of the Queen, uh, the whole of the Wembley gig. And it was important to me that it was the night that I was there as well, the Saturday night we recorded it. So I think the Friday night, Charles and Di were there or something. So, so to me, the fact that the DVD is the night that I went to, um, and another thing on it, in the house that I used to own, uh, or rather in the lane I used to live in, there was a guy there who can clearly be seen in the front, in the, in the crowd scenes, as the camera pans across the cra crowd, you could see this guy, um, you know, he was there at the time, so there's a few people I've met in the past which have been there, and it's kind of a... Thing that pulls it all together, um, and I just enjoy. It's kind of that. I think the full DVD came out a lot later on. I think there was a video that was a lot shorter, but then I, I was always waiting for the complete, you know, complete DVD with the full sort of Brighton Rock, you know, thing where Brian May's parading up and down uh, with his guitar. Uh, I've got it set in my calendar on the computer, and it reminds me that. It's time to watch that gig again, and I'll watch it. I'm, I might miss it the odd year, but you know, hit it the next year. So, so it's a, it really did feel like a life-changing event, then. Yeah, I think I think so. I think so. To see some of those, uh, one of the interesting things about In Excess actually was, um, th I don't think they were on the program. Mm. So I assumed that they were called In Excess, as in I N E X C S. That's you know spelled out. Uh, a few years later. There was this band that I thought were called Inks, who had played in Bristol. And they played the, the Hippodrome, I think it was, in Bristol. And I didn't go to that. I thought, it's that bad. I don't know. You know, remembering In Excess was superb and incredible as an opening act in, in Wembley Stadium. And then just on the cusp of their you know, fame, they played it in the Hippodrome in Bristol. Um, but I thought it was a band called Inks. And it was a few days after when I re when. I think I read the review, or there was a review on the radio or something, in excess, I was like, ah. <laughs> it, to me, those, those, gigs, those gigs were amazing, but I've been to other bigger gigs since where the experience hasn't been that great. You know, the, the Queen and Pink Floyd were such a spectacle that, you know, 
they would fill a stadium up. If you're there watching someone and they're incredibly small and you know not doing uh, not doing an awful lot, and I've, I've come away from s other bigger gigs being a bit more being sort of disappointed. Uh, that's kind of why I like the local music scene so much, is it's, is it's more intimate. Between the ages of about 16 and 18, going to local gigs um, in the Bristol and Bath area. So I lived between, lived roughly dead centre between Bristol and Bath. And that was pretty good for going to gigs. And that is where I think I picked up the, the uh, this is what a small gig is like. Right. So my friends around me were more into, uh, you know, sort of, the wonder stuff and Ned's Atomic Dustbin and things like that. You know, and those were the sorts of things that we go and see locally. So these were these were proper, you know, these were proper gigs mm -hmm. on up and coming tours of of bands. So there used to be a Bristol magazine called uh, Venue, I think it was, which was kind of like time out time out for Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, and in there you'd see the, the lists of bands that were coming up. Then later on, I, th I think as I got to know more musicians. Um, there were times when I'd hang around with various bands and things and go to some of their gigs. Generally though in Bristol and Bath at that time the gigs were paid, you know, even if it's a, I don't know, a couple of quid to get in. Or so. uh, some friends of ours were in a band called, um, well I got to know them after that. Uh, there was a band called Claytown Troop who were the, apparently the fastest band to sign to Island Records at the time, and they were very much Bristol and Bath based. They had a support band play with them once at Beer Keller, and this is when uh, Claytown Troop were on. Yeah. Looked like they were on the cusp, but they didn't quite make it. Um, they had a support band at the time, which was uh, Terror Vision. Right. <laughs> so so I, I must have seen odd bands that, uh, I've forgotten their names, that's the one that sort of stands out in terms of, I remember them as a support band and not being very good, and then for a few years after that, they were quite, I think, quite a thing, you know. I was in Cheltenham for a couple of years, um, uh, for college. Um, I used to go back to Bristol now and again to see what my friends there were still seeing. So, right. although saying that, no, we did, I did see some, did see some good bands around that time because the one of the first gigs that was on in Gloucester, I forget the hall in the centre of Gloucester, but there's a there's a hall there somewhere. Um, was the Pixies. Right. So I saw the Pixies play, and for our opening sort of party at Glosscat, as it was then, uh, Gloucestershire College of Arts and Technology, there was a band called um, was it Goodbye Mr. Mackenzie, right. and I was rather taken by a backing singer who turned out to be Shirley Manson from Garbage, obviously. So. That was quite interesting because I remember watching this band and they sort of they'd had a hit or something and they'd been employed by the college to you know, put a night of entertainment on. But I think I spent the whole gig looking at uh, <laughs> looking at Shirley Manson, the backing singer. Obviously, went on to much bigger things. Um, you know, Mark and Mard, their their show that they used to do, I think it was on Radio One at the time. And um, I remember hearing uh, uh, Jeff Buckley play for them in the studio and thought. I need to see him when I'm at Reading and he was on the second stage. You know, and I made this point, you know, it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you stood there in the smaller stage watching Jeff Buckley play. Uh, and that was that was incredible. So I try and pick up influences as early as as early as I could. I think there's always a bit of competition, isn't there, with that? It's kind of I knew them first or I, or I saw them first or or whatever. I I don't think I was really like that, but it was always quite interesting when you when you picked up on something earlier on that, that, that then grew into something into something bigger. I uh, met a girl in Cheltenham, went down to Bournemouth and Paul, uh, Bournemouth, Paul, sort of Ringwood, uh, Hampshire area, and was didn't go to many gigs there apart from the occasional excursion to sort of Reading to go to a festival. And she wasn't really into live music, so, you know, she wouldn't like to go to those things, and she didn't like uh, large gigs either, so I don't think we used to go to any gigs. So. Uh, one of her friends, a family friend of hers, was a drummer for Thea Gilmore, a very talented singer-songwriter, who's getting quite a lot of Radio 2 sort of airplay at the moment, but I went to quite a number of her gigs locally, 
Um, I used to go to like the Brook in Southampton, and um, I used to go with the guy who played the drums uh, because he lived very local to me, and go on a few gigs with him because uh, he used to play with um, Judy Zook in her band as well. So. Uh, so I needed a change of scene. Essentially, I was down in Bournemouth, and I thought, why am I living down here? You know, I was down here for that relationship, and that finished. So. Um, look for somewhere else. Uh, I came up, came up to Malvern and um, uh, was working with someone up here but I always wanted to, I, I wanted to be here anyway. Came up here for a couple of weekends in sort of the summer of 2006 to look at properties and things and, and didn't really get immersed in what was going on in the town but um, you know there, there were quite a few people I knew through the guy I worked with and uh, it was it seemed like a nice place, so I came up. What I would say what really got me into the local music scene was I went to explore my local pub, which at that point was the Cavalry Arms, now known as the Morgan. And it was an open mic night. I think I saw it in the paper, you know, in the Malvern Gazette, live music from nine, that sort of thing. And I remembered I'd finished work and not eaten and gone down there expecting there to be food there, but it's a you know, tiny pub, no, no food. And I ended up being the only member of the audience. So you were saying earlier on about this thing we have where musicians play to musicians. Um, that, was, that was a bit of that, except I was the only member of the audience. So it was an open mic night run by, um, run by Gary, uh, or Gazzetti, yeah. his name. And who played at that night? I think it was Lee Drinkwater. Um, Guy Ford, Ray Stroud, uh, Gary playing, and there could have been others as well. But what was quite interesting with that is I'm sat on the bar stool, and um, they're kind of using me as the using me as the judge of their performance. So mid uh, in between songs, they were like saying, what, "What do you think of this? Do you like it? <laughs> How do you think it's going?" <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> even mid even a mid song at one point, it was um, it was Guy Guy and Lee playing together. Oh, this song's going a bit wrong. Should we continue? You know, I thought, yeah, keep going. This is great. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I was, you know, sat in a pub and there were people playing this close to me. And um, one of the things I say about that is that I'm, st I still know those people. Mm. And that one evening, I think, doubled the amount of people I knew in Malvern. And from then on, it expanded from then. Uh, so I looked it on on all their MySpace at that point pages and checked out, listened to them and and that sort of thing. And then went to Westfest, just on my own, didn't know anybody. Uh, you know, I'd been here a, um, a month or so, something like that, a month or two. Um, and watched, I think, every band that played um, and did a, did a little video that I got online, a sort of compilation video. And then in later years, I've then seen uh, Rolf Tippi's video. He did, a, he did a video of Westfest, which is available online, and it's split into about five parts, and it said it was available on a DVD, so I actually went up to him and bought a copy of it on the, on the DVD, because it's got me on it, <laughs> sat there watching, <laughs> watching the bands. I feature in it a number of times, but the interesting thing is, I didn't know anyone then. Uh, he's going around interviewing people about Westfest, and I know most of the people on there. So there's all these, what I call, you know, local Malvern musical luminaries, who were being interviewed and just general local people that I now know. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to have that DVD as a record of that first time and that, that really got me into the local scene then. So there's bands that I've seen ever since, you know, that, that, that played at that one that I've sort of st stayed in touch with and, uh, and kept going to see.